Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Carly and I'm a mixed media artist who specializes in gouache paint and ink and sometimes I do digital painting. This is like part five? Part four? Five? I don't know, of this raccoon painting. And in this video in particular, we are going to go over how I did the ink border for this raccoon painting that I'm doing for Game of Shrooms, which I will explain later in the video what that is. I have to say, I have done so much ink work in my life. The point where the permanence of ink doesn't really phase me, but when I tell you I was a nervous wreck when I started the border on this one, I, I mean it. My hands were shaking so bad. Anyways, to start, I have a ballpoint ink pen, and it's just black ink. And what I did before I started on this poppy petal was I got a scrap piece of paper, just a basic sheet of printer paper, and I placed that down to have something for my hand to rest on. As you know, sometimes if you draw with ink or graphite, it is very common for your hand to end up smudging all of your hard work everywhere, and I really did not want that to happen, especially if I accidentally got any ink splotches. I also used this piece of paper to scrape off any excess ink I saw starting to pile up on the ballpoint tip between areas of shading to prevent any ink splotches happening because there is nothing worse than your ink just dumping a giant pile of crap onto your painting. That This is why I was so nervous. <laughs> was, I was nervous of that happening. But thank god it did it. Now, let's actually talk about what I'm doing. I've talked enough about being scared. I started this poppy flower out by starting with the petal that was closest to the viewer, and I did the darkest point of the line at the very underside of that petal, where it goes towards the stem. And when I end up shading petals, I use a very similar method as I would if I were to draw hair strands, like very silky hair strands, kind of like that. I try not to make the cross hatching as obvious. I use a very light hand and then I build up that deep contrast that I love to do. And like I said before, I am going back to my scrap piece of paper and regularly cleaning my pen because I do not want to mess up this very subtle gradient that I created. It takes a lot of repetitive, soft lines to create a smooth gradient like this with ballpoint. I am also really accentuating the ruffles in the poppy petals, even though when you see a picture of them, they are very dainty and thin, almost like tissue paper in real life. But I am really accentuating those ruffles because, first of all, I think it goes with how I accentuated that with the mushroom. And second of all, I think it really adds to their delicate nature, and I find it to be very beautiful and intricate looking. So I really like adding deep shadows between all of those ruffles. Once I'm done with the petals, I move on to the poppy bud, and this was pretty straightforward. It was pretty much just like shading a sphere. Later on, I do end up adding tiny little hairs that you can find on poppy stems and buds. Okay, I think a good learning point is pointing out how I messed up on the leaves. So my first leaf was the one underneath the poppy petals I just did. And if it looks like a feather, you are correct, it does. I have a method of how I draw feathers. I can do a tutorial on that, by the way, if you want more like drawing videos. I notice I have a lot of painting tutorials, but not very many drawing ones. 
Anyways, it doesn't read as much like a poppy leaf. And you know what? I came to terms with it and was just like, fine. I learned my lesson and I moved on. But I think what made it read more like a feather was all of the extra swirlies and the way that the leaves were flowing. They weren't going outward enough to the sides. If you look at a poppy leaf, it tends to have little branches coming off of the main stem. Not branches, but just like other gro- it's like a cluster of leaves. And that one I did by the poppy, it just is shaped like a feather and it's not really totally correct. So I made a note of that and just chose not to focus too much on it, but I just wanted to point it out. When you're drawing and rendering something, pay attention to how it behaves. Because I wanted this to be very flowy and relaxed looking and really graceful as like a border around the raccoon, I wound up making the leaves look like little hairs by making them too swirly and that's just not how leaves are, you know? Because I didn't add any of the structural integrity of how the growth patterns are in the leaves, it wound up reading as a feather when I tried too hard to make it look flowy and relaxed. And as you can see with this set of leaves that I just finished and adding more stems growing on top of the main stem and also limiting the amount of extra swirlies I put in, it looks a lot less like a feather. I will also note that there are some leaf areas where I kept the center vein blank and that can also make it read more like a feather, but I tried keeping it very, very tiny and I also tried making that negative space for the main vein in the leaves only apparent in places where the light would be hitting that area. Rather than if you were to draw a feather, I would likely make that negative space reach all the way from the bottom of the feather to the very tip. Going forward, I wound up outlining some of the leaves as well as the petals and blending some of that ballpoint ink shading into the painting. So as you can see here, what I do is I first outline a little bit of the leaf that I'm starting to shade on and then after outlining it and creating a good like drop shadow, I guess, onto the raccoon's fur behind it, I go in and shade every single mini leaf in the leaf. You know what I mean? Like these leaves have spikes in it. And after doing that, I shade from the center area where the main stem and vein is outwards until it's really low opacity to the edge of that mini leaf within a leaf. <laughs> is that, I guess that's what I'm calling it now. Oh my god. Another technique I would like to highlight is when I am shading anything, I try my best to go with the contours of whatever I'm shading, especially if it's like a sphere ball shape. In some areas, you can get away with doing straighter... Oh my god, why are my neighbors like screaming? What is happening outside? You give Washingtonian sun for one day and they go bananas, you guys. I, I can't. Anyways, I try to make the cross hatching lines to go with the contours and shape of what I'm shading. That way it creates more of a smooth, natural finish. I love really seamless shading and crosshatching with ballpoint ink and the ink is pretty dry compared to other pens and other methods of ink work. So you can do this really light layered shading technique that kind of reminds me of black and gray tattoo artwork in a way. I actually see quite a few tattoo artists I follow on Instagram using ballpoint ink for their flash sets, so I think that's really cool. 
Again, I like really intense shadows and contrast, so I'm making the shadows pretty deep in the center of the leaf, and then as it fans out towards the tip of each leaf, I am making it a lot more transparent, to the point that in some areas there might not be any ink at all, especially on the very top one. That one would likely be catching the most light, that's why. So, okay, this is a side note. It is so funny watching back some of this footage because you can tell certain parts where I am just completely zoning out. And just for some context, this is sped up to like, like 12 times the speed. I zoned out for like a solid few minutes just staring at a wall for no reason. I do that a lot. Not sure why. Yeah. Takes a lot of thinking power, I guess. So, I mentioned in the beginning of this video that I was very nervous to start the ink work on this painting. I don't know how long it took me to finish the painting portion of this piece. Anyways, I, you know, obviously I spent a very long time making the raccoon his iconic self, and I was just so scared of messing that up permanently with ink, and I was also worried like, okay, I've combined gouache and ink before but I've always put like a color behind the ink work and made it tie in more with color. This is the first time I've done it where it's just ink around gouache and I was just really nervous that I would look at it later and be like I ruined it. I completely ruined it. I'm such an idiot. I should have just painted everything. And to be honest, would it look cool if I painted the poppies? Yeah, obvious. It, that would look really cool. But my goal for myself isn't really to be like, let's make super cool realistic art. That's not really my goal. I mean, it is definitely something I aspire to have in my artwork. And I spent many, many, many many years trying to be able to render things realistically but right now i'm in a stage where i really want to experiment with multiple art styles and mediums that i love because i love drawing and i love painting and i really just wanted them to have a baby you know so as you can imagine this was very nerve-wracking to me because i was so used to doing it where i would put ink over gouache instead of letting the ink be by itself right next to the gouache if that makes sense so naturally yeah i was just realizing this is a huge risk i'm taking now could i have just scanned it and tested it out on procreate yes I absolutely could have done that. I'm literally just now realizing that. Did I do that? No. I just I just went ahead and inked it. No regrets. I love how it turned out, but why didn't I just try it on Procreate? Learn from my mistakes and dumbassery so you don't have to waste your time like I do. That's why I'm here. You're welcome. <laughs> Also, for the poppy buds, I realized that different types of poppies, I mean, obviously a lot of plants are like this, different types of poppies have different shaped leaves and they have different shaped buds. I noticed that the common orange ones I see here in Washington and um, that I grew up with in California, the buds have like a cone shape, but the other kinds of poppies that are like the red ones, they have the bulb looking buds. And I did end up adding eyeballs in the center of the poppy flowers. I've been drawing flowers like this since high school. And I graduated in 2014. So I've been drawing these for a very long time. Um, you could scroll back all the way on my Instagram. I don't know why I started drawing these, but I've noticed a lot of people have been drawing flowers with eyes in them. I don't know when that became a thing. We were all just airdropped in our brains to start drawing this. But I like doing this. I just think it looks cool. 
Hence why I also put one on a mushroom. I really like the otherworldly look to it, so yeah. More eyeballs, because that's what I do. I made sure that the light source on the eyeballs were generally correct. I don't think they totally are. I'm just gonna ignore that. <laughs> I'm gonna ignore that. All right, so now we're starting on the butterfly. I got an orange watercolor pencil and I'm just blending that out as the base. I didn't use gouache as the base because I still wanted a little bit of transparency with this orange. In the end, I probably could have just used gouache because by the time I put in the other colors and the ballpoint ink for the monarch butterfly design, you wouldn't really notice the transparency, but whatever. Then I put a red watercolor pencil on the inside of the wings towards the body and outlined the wings using that. Blended that out and then I added some yellow watercolor pencils and I blended that out towards the tips of the wings. Once this is all blended, it creates kind of like a gradient sunset looking vibe. It just gives subtle variation to the wings, gives it some dimension versus just doing flat orange, you know? It makes it look like the wings are tilted up. Then I got my trusty mechanical pencil. I only use mechanical pencils. I will never use a wooden number two pencil, okay? These are just so pointy and sharp and it's perfect for precision. I am drawing out the design for the wings. That way I can have a very clear guide when I go in with ballpoint ink. Then after that, I fill in the design with the ink. I do have a tendency to hyper fixate on things and want to get too detailed, but I'm trying to refrain from doing that because I am going to be layering on some pastels over this butterfly later because I'm trying to make it look like it's glowing and the details would just get kind of lost to be honest. All right, we're at the final part. A big tip I have for making things glow or look like it's emitting light or even if you just want to cast a very general shadow, pan pastels. So this is what they look like. It looks like makeup, kind of. It's in a compact and you use tiny little sponges or you can use brushes if you want to apply the pigment. It's basically chalk pastels, but in a compact format. So it's easy to kind of paint with. I like applying this over gouache because gouache has a very subtle gritty texture and it actually holds onto pastels really well. I'm also making this painting on 8 by 10 inch mixed media board. It is what's called a cold press 100% rag surface. So it's very heavyweight and rigid and it holds onto a lot of medium. So this is the perfect thing to paint on and to create a very mixed media piece on. I will also say that when I was painting with gouache and using a lot of water with watercolor pencils, this did not warp at all. It did not even tape down the illustration board, so I highly recommend this. A great thing about using these pastels to make it look like it's glowing from the third eye is that if you over apply too much of the pastels, you can always erase it. And what I'm doing here is I'm kind of trying to make it look like it's glowing from the iris as well, which was really tricky because it wound up getting rid of all of the detail work I did. So I had to really fine tune it and erase it in very detailed areas around the eye so that it still had the detail that I worked so hard on, but also looked like it was glowing. I also included rays with yellow pan pastels and I put some white pan pastels in between and that created a very ray beam of light looking situation. 
I also put some around the butterfly and when I did that I left some negative space between the butterfly and the orange glow to make it look like it's emitting the light from within. Again, using pastels, specifically chalk pastels or pan pastels, is such a great way to put a whole wash of color over an area of your painting that you already worked really hard on. I also use this method in a painting I did for my dad. I had a bunch of stars in the background and the moon and I didn't want to lose all that detail and I really didn't want to spend even more time creating a super smooth gradient with gouache because as you know that can be tough sometimes. So instead I just used a white pan pastel and pretty much brushed that on and it creates such a smooth airbrushed look. After I made the third eye glow, I went back in with my detailed brush and added in some more white hairs around the third eye on the raccoon. This just makes it look like it's glowing from the eye more because the hairs around the area would catch a lot more intense highlight going on, you know what I mean? And the painting is pretty much done. I'm gonna continue the time lapse and show you guys the final piece and a video of me signing it. But real quick, I just wanted to remind you all that this is part of a series called Game of Shrooms. Game of Shrooms is a worldwide mushroom themed art scavenger hunt where artists post online hiding spots in their local area of where they're hiding their artwork and you can go find it. So free mushroom artwork. The hunt begins on June 11th and follow me on my social media handles if you're interested. And if you're living in Washington state, you can possibly find some of my artwork. Anyways, I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and I will see you next week. Bye!